Get comfortable, relax. We're going to have some fun. I hope you guys are ready to hear the word this morning because I am excited. Now, if you don't know me, I'm Mitch, obviously, as Pete just said. I have my beautiful wife, Taryn. She's next to our kids' church, I think. We've been married for just over two years now. In May, as Pete said, we're launching the Bell Divers campus. We have an amazing team going with us. It's going to be phenomenal. Very excited for that. Um, something else about me, I'm an electrician, so I drive all over Perth every day. I do a lot of driving. Um, everywhere, up north, down south, I drive all the time. And through my driving, I've got into a little nasty habit when I drive at work. At work, I have a nav man. I have a GPS. And I have got in this habit that I follow the GPS everywhere. I follow it every turn. I Honestly, bad confession, I barely even look at speed signs anymore because the GPS tells me how fast to go. It's, the thing is great. It knows everything. It makes all my decisions for me. I just punch in the address and off I go. But the issue is that when I get home and I drive, I no longer have a GPS. So the little nav man that I have at work, I do not have at home. What I have at home is my nav woman. She sits next to me in my passenger seat by the name of Taryn and she is constantly giving me directions. She tells me when I go too fast. She tells me where I need to turn, which way I need to go, constantly. Even when I know where to go, I still get directions. You see, the thing is that when we drive, we are constantly making decisions. We are constantly deciding on the little things. How fast to go, where to pull out, where to turn, which way to go, which lane to be in. There is constant decisions that we make without even thinking. We just do them subconsciously, we make decisions. And see, the thing is that in life it can be the same. We're constantly making decisions. Who we spend our time with, how we talk, what we say, how we spend our money, all these different things, the list could go on forever. We constantly make decisions. Unfortunately, in life, sometimes we can make bad ones the same as when we drive, Sometimes I choose not to listen to my nav woman. That's a bad decision, don't make that one. Just, if she's taking you in circles, just go in circles. I'm, I'm lucky, she's in kids' church, still with all good. See, here's the thing though. In life, we can turn on the GPS as well. We can turn on our life GPS to help us make those decisions the right ones. To stop us from getting lost, to stop us from doing too much or not enough or going the wrong way we can turn on a life GPS to help us make those decisions. So this morning I want to look at how we turn that on and how we can follow our life GPS. So why don't you pray with me? Let's close our eyes. God, this morning I pray that it will be you speaking and not me. Holy Spirit, come and have your way and help us turn on our life GPS. Amen. Cool. You know, I love that as a church, for the last month we've been looking at the Holy Spirit. I love that we've been learning about it, we've been pursuing it. I think that's incredible. Personally, I've really enjoyed it. The words have been phenomenal. The encounter time has been amazing. But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is not just for Sunday. It's not just for me and God. It's not just for connect group or worship. It's for every day. It's for every decision. It's for every moment. For every step we take, we need to follow the Holy Spirit. All right. I haven't even read my notes. Cool. So, let's look at, um, so in Galatians, we all know in Galatians chapter 5, everyone's read Galatians chapter 5 probably at least once about the fruits of the Spirit, where it talks about the Spirit versus the flesh and the fruit of each. But it goes on in Galatians 5.25, after speaking of the fruits of the Spirit, it says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. See, once we are filled with the Holy Spirit, once we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we then need to take every step, every decision, everything we do, step after step, with the Spirit. Sounds a bit daunting, but it's not that hard. 
We're going to go through and how we do that today. See, as it says in Galatians 5, when you come to those decisions, it's usually spirit versus flesh. Galatians 5 goes through the different fruits of each. And, um, but when you make that decision, it's spirit versus flesh. And now when I was preparing for this on Friday night, I thought I had a really cool idea. Now, I love sermon illustrations personally. I think they're awesome, something fun, something visual. And so I thought I would do this really cool sermon illustration that you'll realise in a minute why we're not doing it today. I thought it was really cool. I got some oil to resemble the spirit. We've all read in the Bible, the spirit, the oil. So I thought, great, I'll use some oil. That's the spirit. I got some water to resemble the flesh. After all, we're made up of mostly water, so it works really well. Water and oil, spirit and flesh. I thought it'd be great. I'll put them in a pot, and what I'll do is I'll put the pot on the stove top and I'll heat it up. This is going to resemble, you know, the pressure of life, the stress, the heat that you face, those decisions, those tough choices. And I thought what will happen is in my head I thought I was really smart. I didn't do any research though. I turned the stove on and I thought what was going to happen is the water was going to heat up, the water was going to boil through the oil, and the water was going to evaporate in steam. That was my plan. Sounded really smart. It was going to resemble how, you know, the spirit and the flesh, when the tough times come, only the spirit will remain. The decisions of the flesh will fade away, like the boiling water and the steam. Sounds really great and really smart. But now, unfortunately, I taught myself a lesson that was not the one I wanted to prove. <laughs> what happens is, at a certain point, the water boils so hot underneath the surface of the oil that the water doesn't actually bubble through the oil, it just kind of explodes. <laughs> And now I thought I was really smart and everything was fine, so I did it while I was cooking my dinner. So I'm standing there, cooking my chicken, and then all of a sudden, in the pot next to my dinner, this oil and water just explodes all over my kitchen. It was not very nice, I'm still cleaning up the oil at home, and it kind of burnt my arm a bit, and I've got some blisters to prove it. But we learnt a lesson, you see, it wasn't the one I wanted to prove. But the lesson that was even better than the one I wanted to prove, even better, is that you cannot mix the spirit and the flesh. Don't do it. Don't try it. <laughs> but you cannot mix the two. When you mix the spirit and the flesh, first of all, it leaves your pot really empty because it's now all over your floor and your arm and your walls. It leaves it really empty and it creates one heck of a mess. I mopped the floor four times. It's still oily. My wife comes home, Taryn, and she goes, why are my feet oily? I found a patch of oil over here. Oh yeah, about that. It makes a horrible mess. Do not mix the two. So this just shows that when we're making those decisions, that when we're choosing our steps and step by step we're walking our life, we have to choose the Spirit. We can't mix both. We can't do spirit on Sunday and at work on Monday step back into flesh. It just ends with an empty pot and a big mess. <laughs> now, if you are taking notes, I've titled this message this morning, Me, Myself and the Holy Spirit. Because I don't know about you, but especially after Friday night, I don't want to make the decisions by myself anymore. I don't want to do it by myself. I want the Holy Spirit. I want to live life with the Holy Spirit. I want my decisions and my choices and my directions to be navigated by the Holy Spirit. So, how do we turn on this life GPS to help us make those decisions the right ones? How do we live by the Spirit? If you have your Bible with you, why don't you turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Let's look at the story of King Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah, and the people of Judah, and what happened to them. Now, just to give you a little bit of backstory, what's happened here, um, when King Jehoshaphat, it's a really awkward name, I feel like I'm going to stuff it up at some point. But King Jehoshaphat, when he was appointed the king of Judah, uh, you can read in chapter 17 later if you want, you can see where when he's appointed, he does the right thing, he pursues God, he removes all the false idols and he chases after God and God's ways for the people of Judah. And he does this and he finds favour with God, he's a great king, everyone loves him, all really good. You can read that from chapter 17 through to 20 if you want to later. But we're going to pick this story up in chapter 20. And now what has happened is the people of Judah and King Jehoshaphat have just received word that there is a vast army coming to attack them. There's people coming that are going to try and take over their land. 
basically they're about to go to war. They're about to be attacked. And so we're going to pick this story up here because if you want to talk about the pressure of life, having to make tough decisions, being in hard times, I feel like an army coming to attack you is pretty good. Probably beats, you know, the small decisions of day-to-day life. So, but let's look at this story. Now, I'm going to quickly run through the story with you. If you want to read it in full later, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. But we're just going to quickly go through the highlights now. So what happens, the reason I chose this story, is King Jehoshaphat takes an incredible step of faith. He, does, he makes a bold step. You see, his first step is as soon as he has found out, we can read in verse 3 and 4, it's on the screen, is, this is what it says, Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. And this is, after this, they all prayed, they all stood together. This is where they all come together. How cool is that? That their first step is let's seek God. And now, it goes on, they're praying, they're fasting, they're all together seeking God for help on this army coming to attack them. If you read it in verse 14 to 17, I won't read the whole thing because it's pretty long, but basically, they receive a prophetic word. A guy stands up and says, this is what the Lord has said. And he tells them that when the army comes in the morning, they're to go out into the field, they're to stand, and they're to wait, and they won't have to fight the battle. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone told me that when an army's coming to attack, I don't have to fight, I would probably laugh at them. Like, armies don't come for brunch. They don't come to talk it out. They don't come to see how you're going. They come to fight. So when an army is coming to tell me I don't have to fight, sounds pretty crazy. But see, the story gets even better. These guys are awesome. They were so spirit-led that it tells us in verse 18, after hearing this word, they fell down and worshipped the Lord. I think that's pretty cool, that they hear this crazy word. It makes no sense. An army's coming to attack and we don't have to fight. And they fell down and worshipped the Lord. See, the next day then, they get up and they go and they do exactly what the prophetic word says. They go exactly where it said to go. They do exactly what it said. And they wait and they don't fight. Now, the incredible thing is that you can read in um, verse 22. It says that as as they began to sing and praise... The Lord set ambushes against the men coming to attack them. It tells you where the, the towns they come from and that in the book, but they're more tongue twisters. So, but then in verse 24, the Lord sent the ambushes, and then the people of Ju- Judah and King Jehoshaphat, I knew I was going to get stuck on Jehoshaphat eventually. Verse 24 says that they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. See, what happened is, the people that were coming to attack them then got ambushed and they got so confused in the ambush that the people that were coming to attack them then started fighting each other. What happened is these people coming to attack were ambushed and then everyone just killed everyone and the people of Judah never had to fight. How crazy is that? The prophetic word said, you will not have to fight this battle and they didn't. They did not hurt one person. They did not one of their people were hurt. They stood and waited and they did not fight. See, King Jehoshaphat was led by the Holy Spirit. He didn't just encounter the Holy Spirit at church or a connect group or in worship. He took the Holy Spirit into every day, into every decision. As soon as he found out there was a struggle, as soon as he found out there was a challenge, he turned straight to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Sorry. See, let's look at this story because King Jehoshaphat, he had his life GPS on. He knew how to follow it. And so let's go through it and see what we can do to do the same. Now from this story, I've got three simple steps on how to live by the Holy Spirit. How to follow your life GPS, how to make those right decisions. So it's really simple. The first one, to get started, first we need to hear. Before we can do anything else, we need to hear the word. You see, when he, when he decided to resolve of the Lord, he could have prayed, God protect us, help us, and then gone. But he didn't. He waited, he stopped, and then waited for a prophetic word. First, you have to hear. See, when I get in my car, before I can follow my GPS or my wife, first I need to hear what they have to say. First I need to see where they're telling me to go. 
Because I can't take any directions, I can't take any turns, I can't make any steps without first hearing. See, a lot of people get stuck at step one. See, it seems kind of simple that to follow the Holy Spirit you have to hear it. But a lot of people get stuck here. A lot of people think, I don't need the Holy Spirit for this decision, I've got it by myself. A lot of people think, I do this all the time, I can do it, I, I know what to do. Or a lot of people think, that's just for the pastors and prophets and you know special people. I don't need the Holy Spirit, He won't speak to me. But see, the thing is, that every single one of us needs to hear from the Holy Spirit. You see, when we read in one... Uh, sorry. So when I thought of hearing, the first thing that I thought of is the story of 1 Samuel chapter 3. Most of us would know this story. It's of Samuel in the, in the temple and when God's calling out to him and he doesn't know how to respond. He doesn't know what to say. The Holy Spirit calls him three times before he even responds. And see, the thing is, so that's the same as a lot of us. He's God's there, he's speaking, but we don't know how to hear him. We don't know how to listen. And see, for the people that don't think God will speak to them, for the people that don't think they need to hear from God or they have to be someone special, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So if you think you need to be someone special, he didn't know God, he didn't have a relationship with God. But God still spoke to him. And if you have to think you have to be a part of some special club or that it's something really hard, or it said then uh, later in that verse, it said um, it said that the word of the Lord was rare. And now, see, the thing is, that was Old Testament. The word of the Lord is not rare anymore. And even then, when it was rare. The word of the Lord still came to someone that didn't know him. There was no one special. So if you think that God doesn't want to speak to you, he does. Some of you are already sitting here trying to justify how that doesn't apply to you. How, no, no, that's, that's not me. That's for the person next to me. That's for someone else. They, they need to hear. I'm good. No, no, no. Every single person needs to hear. See, when it was Samuel, we can see what made the difference. We can see where things changed. The first three times that the Holy Spirit called out, he didn't respond, he didn't hear from God. He ran to Eli. But then in verse 10 to 11, it changes. Just going to look at the, the key point there that says, Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening, and the Lord said. See, God is speaking. God had been speaking to him numerous times, but it was when he stopped and he said, Okay, I'm listening. Speak. And then he heard See, the thing is, God was speaking all along. He just had to change his position. He had just had to stop and listen, then he would hear. Okay, now if you struggle to hear, I understand sometimes people might think it's hard or you might, some people get frustrated thinking that I can't hear from God. I can't hear the word of God. You can do practical things to make it easier. If you want more in detail, you can join Pastor Pete's Supernatural course. <laughs> but you can also, okay, King Jehoshaphat, see, he gathered all the people and he declared a fast. So if you're struggling to hear and you want to hear from God, you can start praying and fasting. You can start seeking it. You can start going after it. That's what King Jehoshaphat and all the people of Judah did. So do the same. The other thing you can do, is you can surround yourself with people that are believing with you and praying with you. See, King Jehoshaphat gathered, gathered every person from every town in all of Judah. That means no one was left out because everyone needs to hear the word. But it also means that the power of us gathered together. And now if, if you want that and you're struggling with that, you can do that every Sunday. You can come down the front. Or even better, you can come tonight to the anointing service. There's all my sneaky plugs done. <laughs> All right. Now, in Psalm 139, verses 9 to 10, it says, If I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. See, the Holy Spirit wants to guide each and every one of us. You can try and justify why not you. You can try and explain how you're far away. But it doesn't work. He wants to speak to each and every one of us. No matter the situation, no matter the season, He wants to guide you. He wants to be there with you. See, the first step, the first point 
towards walking with God and walking in the Spirit and having your life GPS turned on is simply to hear. You simply need to hear a word from the Holy Spirit. Before you can do anything else, you need to hear. And now when I'm driving and I've got my nav woman sitting in the passenger seat, I definitely hear. Okay, I've got the hearing part down pat. It's hard not to. Okay? Now, that's not what normally causes the issues. What normally causes the most issues between me and my nav woman is the trust. See, she can tell me the directions. She can tell me where she thinks I should go. But unfortunately, I don't usually trust the directions. Maybe I think I know better directions. And see, it's the same thing. With the Holy Spirit, we all do the same thing. Some of us hear a word, we have a prompting, we feel that heart breaking for something, we get a word for something, and then we question it. We don't trust it. We think we know better. Maybe it would be easier if I just went this way. Maybe, you know, I don't need to do this bit, I can just go here. Maybe we can push the limits a little bit. You see, the next step to the walk by the Spirit is to trust. You can hear a word, but then you need to trust the word. You need to have faith in the word. You need to stand on that word because I can't follow the directions if I don't trust them. See, when King Jehoshaphat received that word to stay and to wait and that he won't have to fight, he had a few options. To me, there were two obvious practical options. One, you fight. If you're an army, it tells us earlier in uh, 2 Chronicles how he has this incredible army and he's built this strong army and fortified Judah. So stay and fight. You can do it. You know, Take them on. Fight. You know, That's one obvious option. They're an army. You're an army. You have a fight. That's what armies do. Then the other option is if you're really scared and you think they're really intimidating, is you can run. You knew they were coming before they got there. You've got time to run. You've got a head start. You can make it go. But see, there was the third option, which was obviously the right option, and that was to trust the Word of God. See, it was easy to dismiss that Word. It was easy. It sounded crazy. It didn't make sense. But he didn't do that. He trusted the Word. And now some of you have had words for your own life, for people in your family, for things to do, and you've questioned it. Even now, some of you can remember words that you've ignored or you've pushed down or you've pushed away because you don't want to step into it. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. It doesn't add up. But it's time to trust it. It's time to stand on it and say, no, I heard from God and I know this. See, I love this saying that in hindsight is 2020. Has everyone heard that saying before? See, I love it because it's so true. And the worst thing about not trusting the Holy Spirit is hindsight is 2020. See, if King Jehoshaphat had stayed in fight, He may have lost, he may have won. Either way, he would have suffered losses. Either way, people would have been hurt, things would have been lost. And then in hindsight, he would have said, ah, if we didn't fight, we wouldn't have lost that. And he could have run, but then he was abandoning his whole whole city, his whole nation was gone because he ran. And then in hindsight, he would have said, ah, we could have kept all of that. See, hindsight is 20-20. And it's the horrible thing with not trusting the Holy Spirit. I've had moments in my life where I've not trusted words that I've heard. I've felt prompted, I've had words, I've had pictures, and then I go, no, 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 that's, that's not right, that doesn't make sense. And you ignore it, you push it down, you don't trust it. And then in hindsight you go, now I see why I should have done that. And then there's the great part is, the hindsight is 20-20 when you do the right thing. See, when King Jehoshaphat returned and saw that they were victorious without even fighting the battle, Imagine how much praise they had. It tells us that as they walked away, they were praising, they were worshipping. Because they knew that we made the right decision. They knew the glory of God and the power of their God and the favour they had found because they trusted the Holy Spirit. And we can have the same thing. See, verse 20 shows us quite how much they trusted the Word. Even though it didn't make sense. It says, early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah, and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. How powerful is that? In the face of great struggles, in the face of confrontation, they stood and declared, 
we will have faith. We have faith and we're standing on this word and because of that we will be successful. Some of us need to make that declaration this morning. Some of us are struggling, some of us are starting to doubt that word and it's time to make that declaration. I have faith and I will be successful. See, trusting the Holy Spirit is so important. His word is wasted if we don't. If we don't trust, or we, we don't trust the Holy Spirit, really, it's our pride saying, I know better. I don't know about you, but I certainly don't want to be in that place. I certainly don't want to be saying, I'm not going to trust that because I know better. This is what makes sense. This is what adds up. See, trusting as the word from the Holy Spirit is best done with an action. King Jehoshaphat turned and declared it to all the people of Judah. It's an action. You have to say, okay, I've heard it. I'm not going to keep it inside and bottle it up. This word needs to be trusted in and let out. So maybe it's telling someone else. Maybe it's turning to someone and saying, hey, look, I've heard this. I need to do this. Keep me accountable. Maybe it's writing it down in a journal so that you can go back to it later and you can't question it, you can't change it or twist it because you've got it written down. This is what God said. So, we have a word from the Holy Spirit. He's spoken to us, we've heard it, now we trust it. Now it's time to do something. The final step is simply to do. If I have directions from the GPS or my wife and I trust them but I don't do them, I'm in a lot of trouble. I can still make wrong turns, I can take, I can speed, I can do all kinds of things if I don't follow those directions. They're there to guide me the right way, they're there to make sure everything happens the way it should. So we need to do what the Holy Spirit says. See, if we look at verse 20 again, King Jehoshaphat did this, and if we just focus on the words, they set out. See, that was action. That was doing. They didn't just believe it. They actually said, okay, this is what's happened. Now we go. Now we do. We don't stand still. We get up and we do it. See, doing what the Holy Spirit says is actually a step of faith. It's actually a step of faith in knowing who our God is. It's actually stepping out and saying, okay, I know you've called me to this. I know you've said this, but it doesn't make sense. But I know who you are. I might not understand this, but I know you. I know my God, I know He loves me, I know He wants me to succeed, He doesn't want me to fail, He's not going to harm me, so I step out anyway. It's a step of faith. See, when King Jehoshaphat set out, if they came under attack, they could have been ambushed while they were on the way. It didn't make sense, but he stepped out and he said, I don't understand, but it, I know you. I know my God. You're a good God and you love me, so I go anyway. See, once King Jehoshaphat set out to do what they had heard from the Holy Spirit, he was really taking that step. And he was handing over control. He was saying, I was in control. I'm the king. I had control over what we do. But now I'm not following my direction. I'm following yours. So now you're in control, God. I'm not in control anymore. I don't know what happens next. I don't decide where we go next, but you do. And it's that handing over of control which personally I think is a wonderfully freeing thing. If the worship team could join me, that would be great. See, when we hear the word from the Holy Spirit, we hear it, then we trust it, and then we do it. And that's how we walk in the Spirit. That's how we follow our life GPS. First you hear it, then you've got to trust it, and then you do it. They're three very simple steps, but they make it so much easier. Why don't you say with me, hear, yeah. trust, trust, do. Yeah. See, this word is practical. This word is for your life. This word is for today. It's for now. So we're going to practice it because it's so practical that we can do it right now. See, so what we're going to do is the worship team are going to lead us in a song in a few minutes. And what I'm going to get you to do is I want you to stand to your feet and first we're going to hear. First we're going to listen, we're going to see what our next step is. What's God prompting you to do? What's he asking you to do? There's always something. There's always a next step. There's always somewhere else he's leading you. It may not make sense, but let's listen and hear what he has to say. So why don't you stand to your feet? The worship team are just going to play and sing over us. And just take this time. We're just going to take a few minutes and just hear what God has to say. <laughs>